Former Buffalo Bills left tackle John Fina joins me to offer his perspective on the 2022 season today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Thursday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day. And as a reminder to you, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Well, folks, I'm very excited for our conversation today. I'm joined by John Fina, former Buffalo Bills left tackle, a 10 year starter for the team. And as I started to process more and more what I thought happened in the 2022 season, the more I wanted to talk to John about it. And we've had some text exchanges throughout the season, but we haven't really sat down and really kind of hashed uh, some of this out. And so I'm excited to do that with you today here, John. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Joe. Uh, the only reason we haven't sat down is because when you go back to Buffalo, you got people pulling at you from every direction. You don't have time for the likes of me. Oh, so, I mean, let's put it on the calendar and here we are. Yeah. I, I, thank you for doing this. And look, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you over the last year. I was first introduced to you uh, during training camp and then we've kept in touch. I had a, a real treat uh, going to the Chiefs game with you and, and Jerry Ostrowski and Joe Miller, Alyssa, a lot of good friends uh, were part of that, that trip. And then connected again when we were both in town for the Green Bay game. And I, I've really enjoyed getting to know you, but I've also really enjoyed you becoming like a notable presence in this Bill's social media world, this podcasting community. So kind of curious, what's led to you jumping into those dynamics? Uh, well, I think most of the people in my life are tired of my comedy. So I feel like I have to engage with new fans, uh, and, <laughs> and kind of lay out my dry, uh, somewhat, uh, corny sense of humor. Uh, now really the, the truth is that, uh, I came to Bill's mafia Twitter because my son was being recruited to UCLA. Right. Uh, and that, that's how kids get seen. And I started saying, well, I'm on Twitter. I might as well fiddle around here. And I started searching Buffalo Bill stuff. And the first person who was like, I got a, my first DM was, it wasn't that naked picture of you. It was somebody <laughs> saying, is it really you? And I said, well, yeah, I guess it is. Uh, I pinched myself. And anyway, from there, I just, I, I like to engage, you know, the, some people who think they're famous and we're all worm food at the end of the day anyway, right? Some people will think they're famous, put up a tweet and then just leave it there and let everybody else fights. I like to engage. I like to jump in and mix it up. And, you know, people tend to think that's fun. And, you know, it gives me a, a chance to be connected to this great city, this great football team, this great organization, and just the wonderful people that are there. You know, simple, I guess. John, you said pinch yourself. I, I pinch myself because I get chances to interact with you and, and talk with you. I've shared that with you. Like you're the, the left tackle that I grew up rooting for. And let me tell you something that I haven't shared with you. So um, you were the one, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. Listen, this it'll make sense here. Um, when I was growing up, I had an older brother. His name is Frank. Uh, younger brother named David. We have cousins, you know, a lot of similar ages. And sports were always a big, big deal. And so part of that was, who's your favorite team, right? Mm. And so I've had cousins, and I had cousins growing up in Buffalo that weren't Bills fans, right? And that bothered me a lot. And so uh, one thing that my brother, who's older than me, would always say to people who wouldn't say that the Bills are their favorite team, he would say, well, can, can, can you name three offensive linemen? Like, that was the big qualifier. Mm. Like, oh, you're a, you think you're a Seahawks fan? You think you're a Patriots fan? Well, name three offensive linemen. So as the younger brother, I had to make sure that I was always ready to be able to rip off the offensive lineman. So whenever that question came my way, 
it was John Fina, Ruben Brown, Kent Hull, Jerry Ostrowski, Glenn Parker. Like that was my old line, <laughs> and I was ready to deliver. And like now, here you are, right now, talking to me. You're in my phone. We talk. It's amazing. I, I think that is a fantastic way to measure somebody's uh, commitment to a team. <laughs> Frankly, I do. Not only does it honor the people in the trenches, but it shows uh, real commitment, real research. But uh, yeah, man, look, uh, equally, I love uh, talking to you. You've got incredible insight. I love uh, you. You just have such long tentacles into the game and into college where the consumable amount of information is just it's too much. And, I, you know, I have a full time job. I love college football, but, you know, I. I, I, there's no way I could digest all the offensive line play that you get to see. And frankly, I'm jealous of you and, um, and I applaud you. I'm, you oh. know, I think you're doing a fantastic job. I appreciate that. I'll, we'll have to start doing some, some prospects <clears throat> together. I'll send you some tape. We could talk about them. That'll, that'll be fun. I'd love uh, to. I mean, you know, not long tape. Like I always tell people, no, no, I'll you get know, you so. cutups, man. I'll get yeah. you, I'll get you O line, all 22 <laughs> back view cutups. You can rip through a game in 12 minutes. I'll send you oh. three. You could be done in a half an hour. That's that's a dream, right? Yeah, it's I like you, uh, you know, uh, sex, your favorite meal, all twenty-two cut-ups <laughs> with no commercial breaks, right? That's what I love about John, man. You're you you are uh, you got you're always got to be on your toes with John. He's a witty guy, and uh, he's got a lot of a lot of uh, fun factor to him. John, let's let's talk a little bit about this twenty twenty-two season that we just went through, and and the lens that I want to start looking at it through is. By tapping into your experience, the Bills made you a first round pick in 1992. And I love that story. One day we should talk about that. Um, but that was right in the middle of the team going to four consecutive Super Bowls, two before you got there and then two with you on the roster. And so you entered a team with massive expectations, right? Massive expectations. I mean, after losing two, the expectation surely was that the Bills were going to win the Super Bowl. And so what can you share with us today uh, that – can speak to what it's like to be on a team with those types of expectations, because we're talking about a 2022 Buffalo Bills team that was the Super Bowl favorites, and a lot of people are quite disappointed that didn't happen. Man, there's so much to unpack there, but first I have to say, I love the shirt, baby. Man, right. it's a requirement. The- if John Fina's on your show, you better <laughs> have the John Fina shirt. Yeah, uh, Tom Bresnahan would say, that's a great shirt, baby. Let's go, baby. <laughs> I was never a baby so many times as I was in Tom Bresnahan's offensive line meeting room. Yeah, that's a loaded question, Joe. There is so much to unpack. I mean, per, my personal experiences drafted by the Buffalo Bills, thank God I'm going to a winning team. Mm-hmm. All right, that was number one because losing a lot is misery, and you, you've lived it being a Bills fan for you know the short 32 years you've been on this earth. Uh uh, and secondly, amazing. Uh, my family's from Rochester, New York. Holy cow. It's a homecoming. My family had re- family reunion five times a year instead of once every five years as they used to. So for me, this those two things were just mind-blowing and incredible. Professionally, it was great because you were on a team with high expectations. You were on a team with a lot of pressure to really be a pro to deliver what you're supposed to deliver. So those were the good things. Uh, I also was very lucky that I was on a team that frankly uh, didn't need me to start. So I got to develop. You don't see a lot of that anymore for first round picks. And uh, it was, that was, couldn't have been better. If I'd gone somewhere in the first round to a terrible team forced to be on the field, you know, chances are I could have ended up like one of those first round quarterbacks that just, failed miserably, never recovered mentally, and, you know, is now working in the financial industry, which probably not a bad option. Uh, The pressure on the team, you know, so now we're in kind of like that emotional, spiritual discussion. So there's this, there's a resiliency to athletes, as you know, that, you know, just, I I cannot be conquered. You know, I must conquer the type of uh, feeling. And it's, it's this, Every moment of every day, the preparation, the focus, but on the other side of that, there's like a childish humor to athletes, you know, the locker room kind of scenario. And you have to balance that fever pitch with keeping it light enough. And then in the end, when you fall short and there is disappointment, you know, how do you square that circle in your, you know, your emotional, spiritual, athletic, you know, uh, Bruce Smith, the conqueror mind? 
Like, how does it make sense to you? Uh, so you, you go through a lot of that when you're, you know, top level athlete. And I still fight with that, you know, from time to time about my good performances and my poor performances, my bad plays. And, you know, it, you, you live, everybody lives life with regret. Um, you know, but your regret has to be in the right place. So does that make sense? When I say it's in, in the in the right place, like if you've done everything to prepare and you've left it all out in the field and you come up short and you can look in the mirror and say, you know what, I earned my paycheck. Um, but we lost the game. That that's that's kind of the measure of it all. No, it does make sense, and it's going to lead me to some of the questions that I have following up from that. But first, I do need to tell our friends over about our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss this chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Mm. So, John, we, we talked about... Um, just being on a team with expectations and a little bit about processing those expectations. And I want to kind of dig into that a little bit more. What's that like? Is it demoralizing? Um, do you, as it continues to happen? And I know that you didn't, you weren't there from like the 88 to 94 stretch, but you're there starting in 92. Like, did you get a sense that there was players that were losing faith in the direction of the team, losing faith in the leadership like, how is all of that process from a player's perspective? No, um, I don't feel, well, everybody's demoralized in a loss in, in the immediate short term. And that's what our players experienced, you know, back in January. And it lasts different length of time for different people, depending on, like what we said, what where your regret is placed. Uh, I, you know, and I think that I was smart enough not not to try to be too involved such that the decisions of releasing players and acquiring players mattered to me. You know, my idea was I have my job, here's my turf, I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'll let the general manager and the head coach and those people make those decisions. So for me, I never lost faith. Um, I don't really got, I didn't get the feeling that our, you know, our core leadership ever lost faith. <clears throat> but when you let people go <laughs> for various reasons, you, you know, leadership lost faith in a few players. That's the short answer. I, I get that. So as you consider some of the fallout from this Bills team, the 2022 Bills team, and you hear some of the comments that Stefan Diggs has made about, hey, we ran out of gas and uh, frustrated, uh, called it a nightmare end of the season. Uh, you kind of listen to Josh Allen, whether it's on Kyle Brandt's basement or uh, just the different messaging that he's put out um is is does that kind of just lean into everybody handles it differently like how i guess what i'm asking is how much should we be caring about how the players and what the messaging is since that game well again i mean you know the 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 advent of social media gives a player to offer insight on a second by second basis of what their opinion was of the result or their emotional state in the result, which I don't think is a good thing, uh, you know, because your thoughts change over time and then you're not going to continue to update. Oh, we lost the game because of this. We lost the game because of that. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this run out of gas um, mindset. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say excuse. Uh, frankly, <clears throat> I don't know that if they had all the gas in the tank possible, they could have won with the type of game plan that we saw executed against the Bengals on either side of the ball. I, I don't think the players were given the best chance to succeed. Now, <clears throat> again, a, a true class act will take a loss on themselves. So 
Stefan Diggs, who I admire and respect greatly, said we ran out of gas, um, which is a much softer thing to say than what's up with that offensive game plan. And then you start calling people out. And I don't I don't particularly care for that either. You know, my, what I would have said is they played better than we did. Or truthfully, what John Fina would say is they played gooder than we did. <laughs> uh, but I don't like that run out of gas. I mean, how do you run out of gas? You're in, I, I know that Buffalo has been – the city of Buffalo, uh, the leadership from Kim Pagula and DeMar Hamlin and all the other horrific things that have happened uh, in the city and among the teams – uh, the team itself, how do you not fabricate, generate, fake, uh, get up for a game? I, 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 it's not possible. I just don't think it's, I mean, if you're three and 12 and it's the end of the season sure. and, and you're playing at Seattle and the rain is coming down in buckets. Yeah. I kind of see it. I kind of see the gas, you know, level going down. But I, I'm not I, – I just – I I wish I hadn't heard that comment. I just don't love it. I've had a hard time processing that myself, John. And part of the reason I want to talk to you today is that comment we ran out of gas because I don't, I don't think that I know how to process it. Um, because on one hand, I'm very mindful of all the dynamics that this team went through. Obviously, things within the community with the mass shooting and the leadership that they had to step forward with there. Uh, you know, monumental in injuries to guys like Micah Hyde, uh, Von Miller, Josh Allen playing with a partially torn UCL and his throwing elbow, DeMar Hamlin, right? And he wasn't the first player to leave the field in an ambulance that season. Dane Jackson did the same. Dawson Knox, yeah. Jordan some personal Phillips challenge. Jordan with half an arm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot, right? There's a lot there. And so I, I'm mindful of that. But everybody's been working towards this objective of winning the Super Bowl, right? And And – you know, the Bills didn't get to the AFC Championship game. And so we then have to hear messaging about, hey, we ran out of gas. And, and I mean, it sounds like it doesn't sit well with you either. It's a placeholder. <clears throat> it's a placeholder. You ever watch uh, political commentary or ESPN and the, uh, the, the moderator sends a question over to Joe Marino and you weren't expecting the question or you haven't formulated a thought yet? What's the first thing? All of them say in a word that I try to never use. Absolutely. They always do that. You know why? It's a placeholder. It's they're mm -hmm. formulating their thought. And I look at this as a placeholder uh, with no thought to follow. It's a placeholder for uh, I'm Stefan Diggs and I need to get the ball more. Fact. I'm Stefan Diggs. This game plan is not geared to me. Fact. I'm Stefan Diggs and this entire like utilization of the run game of everything is not good. Now that doesn't go well either. So he's balancing that with, we fell short of expectations, which also sucks to hear, but I would rather hear that than we ran out of gas. And I, look, I don't, I don't, I don't expect anyone to be a, you know, a, a super, super massively intelligent thinker that never, ever makes a mistake. Do I think Stefan Diggs is thoughtful? Yes. But sometimes I say stuff that I was like, oh, I'd like to reel that back. Oh. But again, I, and then also, you just might not care. I said it. What difference does it make? We lost the game. You know, if I hurt somebody's feelings, screw John Fina. Who, he's nothing to me. Well, you also don't want guys to be satisfied with losing, right? There's there's the other side of that coin, right? I, I, I hope that there's some emotion to it, right? I hope that there's some type of feeling that, mm. hey, we didn't get it done this year, and, and that's disappointing, and I'm not okay with that. Like, we can live well, in that world too, right? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> look, I I don't think that his comment was a replacement for "I'm mad as hell." I'm really hurt. I'm angry. Um, you know, this this was a devastating loss. I mean, I think Stefan Diggs more than anyone shows uh, often either in his words or some of the photographs taken how deeply he feels the losses. The iconic photo in Kansas City. Uh, losing last year uh, to Kansas City and then, um, you know, this loss. Uh, so uh, there isn't a player on the team. And I never worry about this. And, and, and you know, there's a few expressions I shy away from. They wanted it more than we did. I, I, I don't ever say that one. That one makes me insane. And then the other one is, uh, you know, they don't care that they lost.
Now that's just not true. And it, I, I never try to crawl into somebody else's heart for the amount of emotion or reason that they, um, that they carry with them. I just have to trust them and trust my knowledge of the industry. John, I want to get a little bit more specific into some of the adversity that the Bills face in 2022. And tell me how you think these things are, are you've been through it, how, how these things are handled, like injuries. Micah Hyde, massive pillar of the defense, gone after two games. Uh, Von Miller, of course, lasted longer, right, through the, the Detroit or got injured in the Detroit Thanksgiving game, but then gone for the season. You hear coaches and players say, next man up, right? A great opportunity for somebody else. But let's be real. We know that somebody else is not as good as Micah Hyde and somebody else is not as good as Bruce Smith. <laughs> what is that really like from a player's perspective when you lose a key pillar of your operation like that? So I think what um, what I've always remembered it to believe, first of all, if an injury happened on defense, sometimes I didn't even know until you know, game day the next week. I had enough to think about uh, just with the offense and game planning and play calling, et cetera. So I, I guess I would drill it down to the expression next man up isn't like someone to just line up and play there. It's for someone to line up and deliver, right? And now we don't expect, at least I don't expect Rousseau. Well, I don't expect Rousseau to be Von Miller, but I expect flashes. Uh, I didn't expect AJ Epinesa to be Von Miller, but I expected more from both of them. More, and I, that's what next man up means. It doesn't mean, you know, you're the next pawn to get taken out by the queen. Uh, it means you step up and you flash, you, you, you advance toward the king. You know, you make threats. And that's what it means. So... And it didn't happen, Joe. It didn't happen, man. And the injuries were devastating, but the, I, I say all the time at the beginning of every, everybody's like, oh, the Bills are out. You know, I say, well, it's a war of attrition. If they can stay healthy, I think they have a really good shot. And that, I think that was the number one thing in the end. It was a, it was constant carousel of quality guys who were yeah. trying, they're trying to fit right in the secondary, who performed admirably. But then it just it just wasn't enough. And people say, well, they, they did what they were supposed to do on defense against Cincinnati. They held them to 28 or 31 or whatever the hell the final score was, or 23, I can't remember. And I, I don't want to be – <laughs> I didn't want to be reminded. Yeah. You know, but when the offense struggles, the defense has to hold them to less. When the offense is doing great, the defense has to hold them to less. That's just sort of the deal. Um, I don't put this on the defense. Someone's going to be screaming at the screen right now. I put it on the offense more than anything, but everybody's got to do their job. And next man up is get in there and flash. Don't just, don't just fill a spot. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the injury component, right? Like if they, it's attrition, if they can stay healthy, I think they have a chance. I remember watching the Super Bowl between the chiefs and the Eagles and, you know, seeing the inactive players and there was, 14 healthy scratches on both sides, right? Like those, those teams didn't miss a player of consequence for those games, right? They were healthy. That doesn't mean they didn't have bumps and bruises along the way. It doesn't mean that important players didn't miss stretches, but when it came down to it, they had their guys, you know, mm -hmm. even looking at the Bengals who didn't get past the chiefs, uh, they were down a bunch of offensive linemen. Now it was good enough to get past Buffalo, but when it came down to it, like that was a problem from them reaching their goals. And so, you know, the health of, of a football team is something that can't be, uh, you know, we can't put enough stock into. I mean, it, it matters a lot. Not having Daquan Jones, not having Von Miller, not having Micah Hyde, having Josh Allen playing injured. Like those things really amounted to a lot. I mean, even in the game against Cincinnati, you lose a Jordan Poyer. Uh, you, you know, you have injuries, so it, it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's really relevant. And the Bills have had pretty good injury luck, but uh you know, whether it was Trey White two years ago or some of the guys this year that spent some some big losses. Um, yeah, it's been it's been horrible. And you know, I I think the defense performed admirably, but when you see the time of possession, it's more than just an eight minute swing in time of possession. It is a mental feeling that Joe Burrow and that offense have that hey, we're in rhythm, we have control of the game. You know, there's a looseness to it. And until you get pressure on the quarterback, until you're contesting 
uh, <clears throat> you know, 10 yard out routes or, you know, 14 yards over the middle, uh, which we refuse to do as a secondary. I think the guys, Joe Miller got so mad at me. He's like, what do you mean the secondary played well? And I said, they did what they were asked to do. Sure. <laughs> That's all they did. They did the, the game plan didn't call for them to be mean MFers. And we didn't have that plan in place. So the control of the clock and the confidence that just just settles in and makes the offense feel all warm and fuzzy, like, yeah, you know, we're, we're fine. We got a 10-play drive here. We chewed up seven minutes. We're good, or six minutes. Okay, we got stopped on this one. Fine. We, we'll just make one little tinker, and we're back at it. You know, I think that was – that's the hardest part. It's 26 points, but the feeling during the game was just – Oh, it was it didn't it just tear at you like we can't yeah. get off the field. Joe Burrow looks so comfortable. It looks like they can do it. That feeling, I'm I'm not a death by a thousand cuts guy. Go after the quarterback, come up with some really good blitzes, get there. If it fails, we get burned. I get that. I mean, they do it to our offense. Yeah, I, I remember watching the game and I lost hope uh at the, the sequence into the half and coming out into the third quarter, the Bills had the double dip opportunity, chance to get back in the game. Really didn't happen. It didn't feel like the game was ever competitive. And it was like, I spent the entire second half of that game with no belief that the Bills are going to win. And meanwhile, my wife and my, my sister-in-law, you know, they were like very st much still into it and upset with me that I had already accepted the loss. And I'm like, guys, I, it's, this isn't a fair fight right now. The, the, the Bills just don't have it today. And, and, I'm not going to sit here and allow myself to, to get hope. I'm going to start processing this, this right now. Um, so, John, as we kind of wrap up here, I want to um, talk a little bit about some of the things that you'd like to see different next year because I feel like in in listening to your comments today, you, you've alluded to maybe some game planning and some, um, some coaching decisions that maybe uh, prevented the Bills from having their best chance to beat the Cincinnati Bengals, at least in that game, and – Maybe you can go back to some of the playoff losses over the last four years and, and and find some parallels. And so as you consider what you want to be different about this team next year to not stall out, where does that conversation start for you? Well, there's going to be personnel changes. And, you know, I I will always defend offensive linemen, you know, on Twitter when people are like, this old line sucks. And I'm like, I always just, my retort is always the same because I'm, I engage with, Bill's Mafia, don't expect me not to when I push back. Mm -hmm. And my comments are typically, specifically, who don't you like? Why? What circumstances? I want to know, right? I mean, what do you really know about offensive line play? Do I think our offensive line at a B average? My, I'd have to consume the entire thing as an aggregate. Might be a B or B minus. We have some good players on the offensive line, but I think the what everybody misses in this whole offensive line screaming match is we we never had a cohesive philosophy of our running game. We just don't. And, you know, Ken Dorsey, I think, is a very young guy, but he needs to get the run game coordinator together, and they need to come up with something and say, this is our identity, and you just need to push that will every game. And if you fail with your running game, then you fail with your running game. I don't like this idea of, oh, we're going to run pin and pull against them. We're going to run zone against them. You need to have a variety of plays within both philosophies, but stick to what you do best. I've, I've been so upset. We do a lot of run game with, <clears throat> with little guys on the edges. We bring mm -hmm. Isaiah, we bring uh, Diggs, uh, you know, all these guys right up next to the tackles and we try to run these zone and pin and pull schemes. But the problem is those guys don't block for a living. And then when the defense moves slightly, they lose count. It's all about counting in the run game. One, two, three, four. I got number one. You got to down the line. And when they move around and then you put these guys in a position where they're getting kind of jungled up in the feet of these massive guys, they don't like that. That's not where they live. And I think that hurt our running game tremendously. Running backs come out of college now with big, big splits and wide sets. They don't like seeing all those people all bunched up in there. Flatten them out with two tight ends if you want and run zone, run your game, but keep the, keep the little guys on the periphery. 
that's what I would do. I would focus on that. And people are like, oh, we don't have a screen game. We don't have a draw game. And I'm like, choose. You can't be great yeah. at everything. Yeah. I mean, I've said that you can't be a you can't be a screen game. You can't be a draw team. You can't be all this. You focus. Number one, number two, number three, number four. That will help this offensive line. Whoever gets let go and whoever comes in, much more than just the physical ability of Joe Miller. There was not a cohesive philosophy for the running game, and it'll take the pressure off Josh Allen. And people say, what about wide receiver two? I do believe that's up for grabs. Uh, I don't know who it is. I think Shakir is amazing. I think um, I think I'd like to keep Beasley and obviously Diggs. I don't know where it goes from there. I'm sure you have your opinions. I don't dig into it. I'm just a, I'm more about where's our philosophy. The same can be said on the defensive side of the ball. I don't <clears throat> I don't like death by a thousand cuts. And we can't play this Walt Corey, bend, 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 don't break defense anymore. Quarterbacks are too good. The rules favor receivers. Receivers are too good. It's too hard to cover guys now. Uh, I, I just think you've got to bring something to the line of scrimmage and make it hard for quarterbacks to get settled in. That's it, man. I mean, I get emotional because I, at Cincinnati game, I'm still thinking about how the hell do I get over what I saw, not from the players, because I think they did what they were asked. I just think what they were asked to do was not going to put them in a place to win. Yeah. Oh. Be, able to, be able to dictate terms a little bit more, right? Instead of kind of catching and allowing the game to come to you. You know, go <laughs> play your game, right? And, and be something before you can be everything. Uh, you I think remember when uh, you were in high school and you were like, you know, hot for the president of the chess club and she led you on, led you on, took you out on a couple dates. And then she was like, I don't know, we need to take a break. We need to take a break. And you were, you know, just gave you hope and hope, you know, you'd have rather her just said, you know, you can't play chess. You're not that handsome. My mm -hmm. girlfriends don't like you go away. And then you'd be on the road to recovery. That you know, thousand cuts is it's misery. Wish you didn't share that story, a real story about me in high school. That that cuts deep here as we close, John. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you could take it, buddy. Yeah, you I got, can handle you got it. your superhero uniform on, bro. Well, yeah, it's the John John Fina 70. Of course, this it's is nothing me but transmitting superhero. energy. Thank to you. you I receive it. We, I re you yeah. know, you know, John, last thing I want to say here before we get out of here is is um some people would would see my book Go Bills and think that Jim Kelly's on the cover of it, but it's not. It's it's John John Fina's the cover athlete. For go bills, make make no mistake about. It. Put that sweet hind quarter up on the camera if you got Can, it handy, buddy. If, oh, I, it's behind me, and I'm I'm uh, wired in, but it's it's yeah. Right, there it is. I could see it right there. I don't know it's if like, I there's the point there. And my 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 autographed copy. I have one autographed item that I've ever I've never I've got two autographed items, but one that I actually asked for an autograph. The only autograph I've ever asked for. It's John Fina. It's on the cover of my book. So it's it's it my honor and my privilege. Uh, we got to talk a little bit more. Um, and as an aside, I'm, I'm driving, I'm flying out to Fresno and with my older son and uh, my younger son, we're going to meet up with Pat Hill, uh, my old mentor, NFL college offensive line coach. We're going to talk about college players. We're going to look at some film, maybe do a little field work, man. I gotta, yeah. I gotta get on a flight to Fresno. Yeah, keep your eye on Roman. <laughs> keep your eye on Roman Fina now too. He's, I think he's a legit six, five, two thirty. I took him to a, a a camp, and now he's on he's on the radar. Okay, all right. I mean, you told me about him, but baseball was kind of the path for him, right? But he's getting the football itch. He's kicking both doors open and keeping them okay. open, man. We'll see. Awesome. Be rooting for him. Love it. I uh, love having you on, John. I really appreciate you giving us some of your time here and sharing your insight and. You know, I really appreciate who you've become in this uh, social media podcasting world. So if you guys want to keep up with John, be sure to follow him on Twitter at John Fina. Very, very easy Twitter handle there. And if you're on YouTube, you can see it here on the screen. Uh, that is going to do it for us for us here today on the podcast. Tomorrow we're talking salary cap with Greg Thompson. So don't miss it. Make sure you come on back, subscribe, rate, review, share. Big shout out again to John Fina for joining us today. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.